And so, oh. so okay. So really uh, FYI, okay. we are now recording. Okay. Uh, we are recording. Um, that was Seth's voice, by the way. He was talking about stealing the AP Um. Okay. So, so we're going to start off by talking about entropy. Um, oh, that's too funny. We're going to start off by talking about entropy, and we're going to go through the notes, um, not directly through the notes, just the major ideas. Um, but entropy is, is a kind of a measure of chaos, right? And it's represented by letter S in our equation. Um, the super basics, let's say you have something going from solid to gas or from gas to liquid, which one is gaining entropy? So solid to gas is gaining entropy, and then liquid to gas to liquid be losing entropy, right? Okay. So you should be able to predict entropy changes based upon states of matter changes in an equation. And then the other one is, let's say we have X becoming Y, and you have one X molecule becoming three Y molecules. Is that an increase or decrease in entropy? That's also an increase in entropy. We're gaining particles, so we're gaining entropy. Cool? And there was actually a question like that on the AP exam. But, um, <laughs> All right, then we move on to uh, Gibbs free energy equations. And will the reaction occur? So the Gibbs free energy equation looks like this it's on the equation sheet. Right? You don't need to have it memorized. You do need to know how to use it. And after you do the math, there are two possible responses. You might have a positive or a negative value for delta G. And for a reaction to be favorable, you want delta G to be negative. If it's positive, it's unfavorable. And so the way I kind of visualize this is if it's unfavorable, that's how much energy needs to be added. All right, you need to add 20 kilojoules to make this a favorable reaction. If it's a negative value, you have this surplus, you have this extra amount of energy and it can still occur. Favorable doesn't mean it will occur, it just means the situation is set up that it could occur, right? Um, and then it's really common for them to go through uh, all the various scenarios here. where delta H could be positive or negative, and the entropy could be positive or negative. And so let's kind of like circle scenarios and discuss, uh, would we get a positive delta G or a negative delta G? If this is negative and this is positive, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, uh, when would delta G be negative? All the time. All of the times. It doesn't matter what the temperature is, right? Because you have negative minus some temperature times a positive, negative times a positive, all answers are going to equal negative, right? Even if somehow the temperature is absolute zero. It still ends up with a negative value and technically could occur. All right, let's go to a different scenario. Positive and positive. It could happen, but what has to happen in order for it to be uh, successful? Small delta H, big delta S. Yeah, and that that temperature needs to assist the delta S. Yeah, the, the temperature has to be big enough the T delta S is greater than your positive delta H. C C or anything has broken up. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Seth and I were. In Espanol. No. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> so 
if you had an X or an endothermic reaction, see, and, <laughs> um, and you were at like two Kelvins, and then the temperature went down, is that how you could reach absolute zero? I, I, I don't know. That was beyond me. Okay. Um, yeah, that's how I would do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would have to reduce the temperature further. And then, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's up? By the way, we're recording right now, so you're not doing that. You're going to want to have this on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. The office is that two questions? You're like, oh. I think I'm almost going to answer. What's up, the wall? You know how we say like the product side is in the bullet and the actual side? It's, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about the that yet. We are actually talking about that. We say that the reaction is favorable. We mean like a reversible reaction can go both directions. And when we say something is favorable, we're talking about the forward reaction is now favorable. Technically, if it's unfavorable, then the reverse reaction is now possible. Um, it doesn't mean it has to be both. I I have, there was three favorite. questions said simultaneously, <laughs> and my brain went. Bleh. It's also still a little thrown off by hugging. Can you repeat it? Taught last year, so now I am. All right, video one, two, three. So, so like, if it's a negative delta G, then the K value will be higher. The K value will be greater than one. Not high, but just greater than one. Um. So you're. Is the favorability plus because you're not asking about the Sure, yeah. I was asking if it has the always reversible reaction if it's unfavorable, if the opposite direction has to be favorable, or if it could just be out like should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what if it's zero? What if delta G is zero? Equilibrium? Very equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's change colors for another scenario, boy. Ooh, what if it's positive and negative? It is always unfavorable. Yeah, there's not a scenario where positive delta H and a negative delta S can result in a favorable reaction. And then lastly, uh, switching colors, why have we not used black? Okay. Um, what if we have a negative and a negative? It's yeah, probably only going to work if our temperature is very tiny. What is one times any number? That number, right? But what if it's closer and closer and closer to zero? This value gets smaller and smaller, and maybe we have a favorable reaction. Um, issues with this uh, delta H. Is kilojoules per mole, maybe not per mole, but delta S is joules per Kelvin. And then you're subtracting them. So you probably have to change joules into kilojoules or kilojoules into joules, right? Before you can do the addition and subtraction, you have to unify the units. You are multiplying Kelvins times Kelvin, so the K will disappear. Actually, this, this is not. Sorry, just to kill you. So before you do the addition and subtraction, make sure you check your units, check your units. That's definitely one thing I would write on my little cram sheet of notes. But I would check the units of H and S before I added or subtract them again. Um, okay, other delta G equations. I'm gonna grab the equation sheet and G. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. So, so there's an equation before this equation, but we don't need to know the equation before this equation. But there's another equation where some fancy math is done, and then this equation occurs. 
You know what I mean? Like you take the derivative, blah, 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 blah. And then this, 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 this equation spits out at the end. This equation is at equilibrium. What is the natural log of Q? What is Q? Q is not at equilibrium. Q is yeah, where we are, right? Where we are right now. If as we approach equilibrium, delta G becomes zero, right? And so this uh, this delta G here though is for non-standard conditions. This becomes zero. And then we can solve for our fancy delta G. So if that's zero, we can move some stuff around. I think this is actually a plus sign. Um, but we don't need to know this equation. We need to know we can use this equation. This equation allows us to calculate delta G or the net or K, equilibrium constant, um, at our non-standard conditions. So if they tell us the equilibrium constant, we can solve for delta G and vice versa. This R is the 8.314. It is joules per mole Kelvin. Um, so when we do that math, we multiply by the temperature, we multiply by the uh, natural log of K. We're going to get joules. Typically, all the answers are in kilojoules, so just watch out for that. Uh, if k is greater than one, then when you get a natural log there, you're going to get a positive value. You multiply a bunch of positive values, and then there's a negative sign. So delta g will come out negative. If k is less than one, meaning it doesn't favor the products, it favors the reactants, you're going to get a negative value, and you go negative times, oh, a negative, you get a positive delta g. So if K is above one, you'll get a negative delta G. If K is less than one, you'll get a positive delta G. I almost said it wrong. Cool. Uh, what if K is equal to one? That's really freaking weird. But then delta G would be zero. So. All right. Um. <laughs> Hess's law also works here. Um, I think it's time to delete. That's good enough. Um, so if you have two reactions, and they tell you the delta G, and they tell you the delta G, well, let's make these good numbers. Plus two and minus three. Yeah. Yeah. We add these two reactions together. And what's our delta G for the new reaction? Negative one. Well, what is the new reaction? Yeah. Um, so we can use Hess's law on delta G. We can also use it on delta S. There, well, if we did a delta F example also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what happens if we flip uh, Hess's law problems around? Thank you. Yeah, everything flips signs. What if we have to double the second reaction for some reason? We double the delta G. Unless it's voltage, yeah. Which we're going to get to in a second. That's half the unit. Woo! Yeah, that's the simplified version of the notes for the first half of the unit. And now we move on to batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, make sure we're still recording. Seth, how are you doing, bud? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, we've got the allergies just like you, it looks like. But other than that, Bronchitis is starting to clear up. I haven't hacked up a lung yet this period, have I? My best uh, teacher appreciation gift was yesterday. 
by far. It gave me cough drops. <laughs> In another bag of cough drops, they actually gave me two bags of cough drops. And then uh, Ricola, Hill, like one of the Ricola. And then uh, hilariously, like two seconds after that, he goes, taken out of cough drop. And I looked at him and go, I'm not allowed to give cough drops to students. <laughs> but, okay. So let's, uh, ooh, let's make the landscape a fun background color. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna make a battery. A um, couple of components we need for battery is our standard galvanic cell battery. Look, we have two beakers, and there's some solution in this beaker, and there's some solution in that beaker, and then we put it in a metal. This metal is orange, so it's probably copper. Okay, and the other metal is gonna be silver. So it's probably I like being able to work in colors. This is fun. It's sick. Look at that. Um, and so our solutions are probably copper solutions and zinc solutions or something similar to that. Um, you know what? I have the skills. Um, use that. There's like a oh. Okay, never mind. Um, we have these solutions. So this is a zinc so I forgot. This is probably a zinc solution, and this is probably a copper solution. And one of these metals is better at pulling electrons, at gaining electrons. What's another word for something that's better at gaining electrons? Redux. Yeah, it's better at reducing, and one of them is better at oxidizing. I just forgot how to write oxidizing. 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 Thank you. And it doesn't help that the pen doesn't quite make with that. So um, we're looking for the GER, gaining electrons is reduction. And we're looking for the LEO, lose electrons is oxidation. And so we connect a wire here. And one of those two metals is going to pull electrons from the other. And Whoever is gaining the electrons is the anode. No, no. Ah, okay. you steered me wrong. Yeah. Whoever is losing electrons is the anode. Whoever is gaining the electrons is the cathode, which is going to be written as CAT. Here we go. So it's A Leo cat GERS is the common mnemonic device. Anode is where we lose electrons, we have oxidations. The cathode is where we gain electrons and we see reduction. Um, I can't remember who's stronger. I feel like it's copper. So I'm going to draw an arrow. It's, it's oh, I think it's zinc. Yeah, it would be zinc because it's a little bit closer to fluorine over here. Oh, you know what? You're going to use logic like that. I'll come you. Um, so uh, it is not uncommon, wink, wink. For them to have you draw an arrow on the wire showing which direction the electrons are going. The electrons, according to some local people, will be flowing towards zinc because it's smaller and closer. Fluorine? Okay, I buy that. Um, uh, after a couple of electrons flow, though, we're going to run into a problem. We'd have a negative charge building up on this side and a positive charge building up on that side. What am I missing? The salt bridge. bridge. It's also not uncommon for them to leave out the salt bridge. And then you have to draw something that looks salt bridgey and explain its function. So I would probably put a simple salt into here, something like sodium nitrate. They typically use nitrates and acetates because they are always soluble. Whereas chlorine occasionally forms solid, they typically pick nitrates and acetates. And now uh, the negative ions could flow that way, the nitrates could flow that way and keep the balance of the charge. So <clears throat> zinc is gaining the electrons. How many electrons is zinc gaining? Two. 
and copper is losing electrons. How many electrons is copper losing? Two. Okay. So the only problem with this example is it's too simple, right? It's two and two. Um, but if this had been aluminum, which, you know what, we can, we can just change the whole problem right in the middle. Aluminum. Aluminum. You must go the other way. Son of a biscuit. <laughs> We could just change the whole problem <laughs> and replace zinc with aluminum, which means this is going to be aluminum <laughs> plus three, three electrons and aluminum, right? Now, when I go to combine these, my electrons aren't the same, right? So I have three electrons and you could probably clearly read that that's a three now three electrons versus two electrons, I need to double this reaction and I need to triple that reaction to show that we have two aluminum ions making two, what? Bless you, don't do that again. Making two aluminums. And then we have three coppers making three copper ions. And how many electrons are being exchanged? Six. And you don't usually see it written there in actual chemistry, but I might do that just so people kind of know, losing six, gaining six. There's six electrons moving around. Somewhere making a note to yourself, because later on, there's gonna be a question where that six matters, all right? And you don't want later on to have to go, that was two times three, and that was three times two, so that was six. Hey, that, that's my... That's beaming. So we can figure out how many electrons are moving around there in the battery. Um, and what's the other Oh, the voltage. Both of these would have a voltage. We're doing simple numbers here. I'm not going to go for the real values. So let's say this has a voltage of uh, positive two, and this has a voltage of negative five. Um, what impact, and I know you already know the answer, you took the AP exam a couple of days ago. What impact did doubling this reaction have on that voltage? What impact did doubling, tripling this reaction have on that voltage? Nothing. So the voltage, you just combine these two, and we have negative three volts. Is that a good situation? No. And this is what happens when you make numbers up off the top of your head instead of actually looking them up like I should have. So I should have done those numbers. Then this was negative five, and that was be positive five, and that was negative three. So this would be positive two volts. Um, what does change? When we double or triple a reaction, yeah, amperage. the amperage. So it's not the potential that's changing how many electrons that are moving around, and that's actually a reference to amperage. So this is going to be reflected uh, in impacting our amperage later. So, all right. So another question. Oh yes. Did you get the sodium metric? Um, inside the salt bridge, there's got to be some boring salt, something that's really soluble. Um, so sodium is a group one metal and always dissolves. Nitrate or acetates always dissolve. So it's got to be some really boring, super soluble salt so that as the electrons move, we can have the ions balance them out. You should have taken AP chemistry. You would have enjoyed it. No, you didn't teach it then. No. Stacy letters that not clarified. So there's no reason we care. <laughs> I saw her like, like do you feel the safer? Like the path that would like, increase in like uh, well, okay, we can talk about that, sure. Um, so as as the anode is losing and the cathode is gaining, this piece of metal and that piece of metal is actually changing in size. Um, if this copper is going from solids to aqueous, then we actually are losing copper. And this piece of copper gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier because it's no longer solid. It's now dissolving. 
And what happens to the molarity, the molarity of those copper ions? It's going to increase. That molarity is going to increase, whereas this molarity is going to decrease. And then while that one's getting skinnier, this aluminum ion uh, piece of metal is slowly getting bigger and bigger, like me eating too many Anita's breakfast burritos. Well, I mean, Shane brought hit these guys. Show them what Shane brought here. No, just because they you know, yeah, had extras. Um, I guess he gave them for apes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 you guys aren't apes, yeah. but you're still pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Options. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take, I'll take the penny laugh. <laughs> As actual Never said it again. Uh, <laughs> you don't like people. Okay. Um, so why does a battery eventually die? All batteries eventually die, right? Like even yeah. even Carson has been on a cell phone the whole time. Um, the batteries eventually die because the reaction is running and the reactants get used up. Or we get too many products in um I think they could make that louder over there. Um, no, that's okay. I think yeah. Winston Churchill. Is it? Is it D-U-S? It might be Winston Churchill. I'm not sure. I think it's like a lower drum. Something like English. That would be Winston Churchill. I don't know. It was like lower and grab. Yeah, it's a little more. Oh, yeah. Oh, FYI, this is a Google Meet being recorded. So everything we're saying is actually... Uh, thank you. <laughs> we have so many kids taking the AP exam. We're, uh, we're recording what we got going on here so that they they can follow along later. <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right. Does anybody that's all the battery stuff? Um, battery, 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 battery. Ooh, more Delta G. Delta G. Is equal to negative N F E. And you guys saw this on the well, this one wasn't on the AP exam. Um, it was on one of the practices, yes. But this is where you've got your voltage, all right? You've got your voltage that you've calculated a second ago. This is Faraday's constant, which you don't have to have memorized. No one should know it's negative. I mean, it's 96,485, like. Coulombs per mole of electrons, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is electrons. Where do we get that value from? Where do we get the N from? And what was that reaction? What was the N in the last reaction? Six. Six. And so you've done all this other logic, and then you get to this equation, this question three or four steps later, and you have to magically remember how many electrons it is. That's why I think it's a good idea just to note it when you write the total equation. Hey, this is six electrons, or this is 12 electrons. The exam, the AP exam was 12 electrons, right? Four, yeah, four and three. Um, and so N is uh, six electrons. We multiply these together. And since this voltage is positive, and that's a negative, we're going to get a negative delta G. And at negative delta G, as a negative delta G, then our reaction should be yeah, favorable. The battery should operate properly. Um, so we got a negative delta G should be favorable. Yes, Jenna So F is a constant? F is a constant. Yeah, it's on the equation sheet. This is a big one. And then N, why is it an electron? Um, why is it the I don't know why. Well, because the Faraday's constant is the charge for any one for one mole of electron in the reaction. But your reaction that we just had a minute ago was six electrons. And then voltage is actually joules per coulomb. Voltage is actually the amount of energy per charge. Yeah. Wait, so when I call the back, do you just need the I guess positive voltage, or do you need a positive voltage and the favorable? Well, positive voltage will always result in a favorable delta G value. Yeah. Now, 
on the AP exam, like on Monday, on the AP exam on Monday, that voltage was negative. So that means this reaction is unfavorable, right? That reaction should not occur. I don't remember the value of got worked out. But if it's a negative delta G, it's unfavorable. So then it asks, why should you apply an outside voltage to make this reaction occur? Because it's an unfavorable reaction and therefore wouldn't normally occur. All of the electronics, like that's an unfavorable reaction. Those lights running, that's not supposed to happen, right? You're not supposed to just have electrons jumping across exciting things and the light comes off. That doesn't normally just happen. So how do we force it to happen? We apply a voltage that's greater than what shouldn't happen, right? So that maybe has a positive, I mean, a negative voltage, a negative potential to occur, the lights lighting up. So then we apply a large enough positive voltage to overcome unfavorable and make it favorable. Um, and on the AP exam, they were doing like electroplating or something with rhodium. Oh yeah, that was, that was terrible. What is electroplating? Yeah, what is electroplating? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not as effective as mercury. So, it's not as effective as you need mercury. So, yeah, it's where you coat something in metal. If you ever go to like the pagodas in like the middle of a mall, and there's someone selling a gold ring, and they're like, "Look, I've got this big gold ring. That's a dollar fifty. You're like. What? It's probably a copper ring where they then put a thin candy coating of gold on the outside. They've electroplated it. They've covered it in gold by applying a charge. They apply a strong voltage and then those gold atoms adhere to the copper by forcing a reaction. Right? They're doing a minor electroplate, a minor uh, gold for copper switch that should not occur. And then you have this thin candy coating of gold. How long do you think that thin candy coating is going to last? Not very long. And then you start to get copper to come off of the ring and into your skin. Who here's had the green ring in the skin? Anyone had that? Thank you. The people on the edges, the cool kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My grandfather had it. He had one for arthritis, and then his like whole arm was like turning green. He like bought it. He was like, I don't know what happened. Like I bought this in royal forms for my arthritis. Like, well, that's your first mistake. And then it was like a deep green. Uh, <laughs> Buying a jewelry at a gas station. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got his bucket of chicken and. Uh, they said something about silver tarnishing in that question, yeah. and it's a little bit chemistry beyond me. Like, silver naturally tarnishes anyone that has silver or their grandmother's silver. It looks like this gross gray color. You pull it out of the pantry three years later. You know, the next time you use it, and you're like, oh. And so then you have to chemically treat it to remove that stuff. They said it was hydrogen sulfide, getting silver sulfide. I don't know why you have sulfur put around your house. It's usually silver oxide. Most of the time, it's just the oxygen in your house slowly reacts with the silver. And you get a silver oxide that builds up. You can go to any grocery store and get silver uh, tarnishing, removing fluid or whatever. And you just dip the silver in there and it rips the exterior and makes your silver slightly skinnier because you're removing the exterior coating that's oxidized. And then for like a month or three, it looks shiny again. I mean, if you really want to protect it, Seth, just buy some argon and then put your silver inside an argon container and then you won't have the oxidation and it'll be perfectly shiny silver. Shiny silver. But then you can't use the silver. Well, you can pull it out, eat real fast, put it back. Make sure you create that. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's silver, like forks and knives, silverware. Um, why 
That yeah. usually just removes like bacteria and stuff, oh, yeah. but it doesn't it's cause a reaction hopefully with the surface. Because you only buy like three percent. You buy store brand and you buy like three percent. Or other that's strong enough to corrode the metal. But, but like, this is actually, I'm going to call on this. Cool. <laughs> It's I'm another my <laughs> And then his hand is up. Oh, I thought when you have to apply an external pressure, that fits with like an electrolytic. I mean, add like ATPT and then you have a chemical reaction. Oh, yeah, I saw that too. Say that again. Yeah. Like, like when you add an external pressure, is it just not an external like force? Or yeah, like, in this case, the voltage is the external pressure. Yeah, yeah so um, I thought that's an electrolytic cell and not a galvanic cell. That point, yeah. All yeah. galvanic cells are supposed to be spontaneous. Galvanic cells are typically are spontaneous, where you have a positive voltage. Electrolytic cells are when you know a cell that's set up that wouldn't work, and then you're forcing it to by work by producing it outside. So what's the rhodium plating thing on the AP camera? Was that electrolytic cell? It's electrolytic, yeah, yeah. Because it added up to a negative voltage, so it's not a spontaneous reaction, and then they're providing this outside source. They expect us to say that or just be like, oh, it's negative. Good. Okay. It, they were expecting you to say it's, it's, I'm going to guess that they're expecting you to say that the voltage is negative and therefore unfavorable. So they're applying an outside voltage to mm -hmm. make it a favorable yes. or something yeah. in that arena, you know, without saying yeah. something that's totally wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. always yeah. the danger with yeah. the issue yeah. 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 saying that yeah. 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 it's completely wrong. Yeah. 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 If you say something that's completely wrong and contradicts what you said, because you can't say decreasing the, the volume to cause the reaction to move forward, and then the next sentence say, but increasing, decreasing, like saying the opposite in the next sentence, you can't say things that counteract each other. That's no, like answering the question. I don't know because it doesn't work that way. I'm like, you can write a great GQ and then write, they say, like a paragraph about a unicorn. The world history is not pretty old. And then they'll exactly. ignore the unicorns and they'll give you the point. The problem with like world history though is it's all like these events that kind of tie together humanity making terrible decisions as a society, right? It's not, it's not, hey, we did this thing and the reaction has to shift. Like if I apply pressure to her, she's not always going to make the same decision. Eventually, she's going to break down. Yeah, I can't just write her wrong. Yeah, that's why. That's why it's better. The math is even better. Like right or wrong. Yeah. Sorry, I broke out of time. Since it's hard to lie. Yeah. You took so long to answer my question. I remember my question. So yeah. rinsing your mouth out with hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, I've actually done that. Yeah. Like people say it's bad for your teeth because it strips enamel off. It's okay. bad to repeatedly do. Okay. But typically the reason is someone is rinsing their mouth out with hydrogen peroxide is they've an infection in the mouth. And putting like antibacterial cream in your mouth doesn't work. <laughs> um no, wait, you were, now you remember your question? Yeah. The same yeah. 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 So so, like, if you grind your teeth enough, you might also grind your tongue. And some people will accidentally, like, in extreme grinding, catch their tongue and then wake up and the yes. tongue is bleeding. Or they, yeah, it's really yeah. gross. And so the dentist is going to tell you, or your doctor is going to tell you, you need to rinse out with hydrogen peroxide. Usually cut it in half. So you take tongue. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. so just cut it off. Just cut it off like you did. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> see, you need a new uh, world. I didn't actually say any history in high school. What? what? How did you graduate? I didn't do graduate. I just wanted to see that reaction. It hurts. Oh, yeah, so you rinse out, you, you rinse your mouth with hydrogen peroxide, you spit it out, and you're supposed to all burn. Wait, did so you ask the world history? I took world geo. Uh, we didn't have to take world history. We could take world geo or world history. So I took world geo. And I know about geography of the world, just not the people. Okay. Uh, okay. And I took, I took U.S. history, but I didn't take a push. Because the teacher, the 
to the taught U.S. history was awesome and a family friend, Miss Lindsay. Yeah, um, yeah, she took us. She like so at Valley they do a thing called uh, they do a thing called the Victorian Ball each fall in World History Club. Uh, the U.S. History Club has a dance. And everyone dresses up in period costumes, oh, in Victorian that's costumes. That's you go to the dance location at noon without costumes, and you sign up dance card like Nicole, you and I are going to dance the Shadish together. You and I are going to dance the such and such waltz, and you practice the dance with each person. That's the thing. And then you go home and get dressed. And you show up, and there's like a violin crew there with like cellos and stuff, and they play the music, and you do the dances. So cool! And it was a lot of fun. Right? And that's the only reason I joined History Club because it's so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. Did you take any pictures? No, it's okay if you buy it. So yeah, it's the Yeah, it's just nice. Okay, Mason has remembered his book. Yes, I remembered it a while ago when you kept on talking. I think the one that's so funny. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
It doesn't give off a sign. But if you had a strong enough base, it could be like last. Typically, people think of it as because it's it will move electrons from other things. Okay. And then that's why it's more stable than Yeah. I I feel like I feel like you've covered all of this stuff, and then you guys have accidentally asked questions I wouldn't have covered. No I don't think I've ever made one. No, she's fine. What's probably like two feet away from the trash can? It's not on the basketball team. Yes, he's an awful football team. So, there's this one time when I wasn't really paying attention. What? And like how if it adds up to a negative voltage, you have to like flip it and switch it. Um, if it adds up to a negative voltage, Oh, that that just means that your reaction is not going to run. Like, uh, shoot, I don't know why I'm doing this, but it's happening. So it, it just means that your reaction is not going to run. So if you have like a, a negative three, uh, so you have one reaction that's negative three and another reaction that's positive two, the combined holds which is negative one. The potential of the two reactants isn't set up to actually cause the reaction a lot. You need a positive voltage for that reaction to be successful. So then what might happen is that Sophia might take your reaction and put it in the middle of a better reaction. That's like a positive four. And this better reaction, like the electric socket on the wall, is going to pull your reaction along. The electric socket's 120 volts, 110 to 120. Um, and so it's got enough voltage to make almost all other boring reactions occur. Oh. I realized what I was going to say was very stupid. Go ahead and make it. A lot of dumb stuff. I was thinking if you, if you got the right stuff, to make to put in an electronic device, then it would just run on its own without external power. But that's just battery. So there is, an, yeah, there, there is there is a potential though. Like you have you have these reactions written, and you know the voltage is not what you need. You know the voltage is not what you need, and then you you apply this external source, reversing the reaction. You know. And now this is negative four because it's been reversed, and this is positive six because it's been reversed, and it's positive two. But sometimes when you reverse a reaction, a reaction that's unexpected could occur. Most of our reactions are occurring in water and we love to ignore the water. But one common issue with recharging a battery is that the water might be a better oxidizer than the other substance. Or it might be a better reducer, I can't remember which. And so a lot of times when you recharge simple batteries, you accidentally end up producing hydrogen gas, which is bad, okay? Because hydrogen gas is extremely flammable, isn't it? Um, and so there are some batteries that are set up such that when they get recharged, they have to be recharged outside. Uh, car batteries. I think we've talked about car batteries. Um, yeah, let's talk about car batteries. That's fine. So a car battery is actually uh, okay. Draw your battery. So we're doing car battery so far. Good, good, good. Then we're going to make one lead post, and we're going to make a lead oxide post. So your car battery has those two posts, one's lead, one's lead oxide. This goes down and is split into 12 plates. 12 plates. It actually goes down, goes like this, and then goes across the battery 12 times. And that's obviously not 12, right? And then the other one does the same thing 
goes down 12 times. You got your post and it goes to the left and the right. And then they don't quite touch inside the battery. It's surrounding those plates is sulfuric acid, like eight molar sulfuric acid. Yeah. And so when you discharge the battery, the sulfuric acid is the salt bridge. All right. You have the anode and you have the cathode. And then, you know, the electrons leave the anode, get your car going, and then come back in the cathode. And the sulfuric acid is the salt bridge. And it ends up making lead sulfate and lead sulfate inside the solution. And then your battery has to be recharged. What's the piece of equipment inside your car that recharges your battery? Yeah. Alternator. Yeah. Oh, I was the say. gas powers the engine. The engine powers the alternator. I'm going to get Jenna some credit. Um, and so the alternator gets turned by the engine, and it applies an external voltage that's greater than what the battery is being used for. That's greater than the radio the AC and all those other things. And it forces electrons back in to recharge those plates. And those plates shrink and grow and shrink and grow and shrink and grow. What do you think could happen if they shrink and grow enough times? They can crack, they could fall. You might have a plate come loose and then touch another plate and you have a short inside your battery. And your battery doesn't work. Um, the battery technology for these has become radically better in the last 30 years. They now have like plastic separators, so they're less likely to touch, so they'll last longer, longer, longer. Um, when I was a teensy kid, you were still opening the battery like every six months and pouring water into it because the sulfuric acid would slowly like vaporize out. And it would get more and more concentrated. I'm sorry, the water would slowly vaporize out and it'd get more and more concentrated. And so you had to like dilute it back down. And I don't think anyone out there understood what they were doing. They were just following the directions. So like, I need to open the really dangerous battery and pour the thing in. Um, if you want to watch stupid people, go to YouTube and, and watch people connect that with a piece of metal. There's no resistance. It's the amount of electrons flowing. It's just insane. I don't know what the bolt, the, the amperage is in a battery, but it's not small. It's gigantic. It's the same thing. So, 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 so. I have a question. That's what you started with. Yeah. You don't wear people throw car batteries into the ocean. No. <laughs> no. Solomon H. Work. I don't know when people throw car batteries into the ocean. So like, wait, I have. Are you throwing car batteries? No, I'm not. Where are you getting a car battery from? Uh huh. I'm not even near the ocean. <laughs> All good points, Solomon. That's what we'll test the line there. It's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Solomon, I've never heard of this, but continue your weird scenario. Like, because because there's so many because there's so many jobs acid in the battery. Like, does that like what is the bad thing about the okay. um, car batteries for the ocean? Probably a gonna leave the acid and kill anything in the immediate area b that's lead so you're polluting the environment with lots of lead right and c don't i don't i like to disclaimer i don't throw car batteries into the action i'm gonna add your first battery no no Oh, um, Mason has a follow-up question to Solomon's battery. What's the question? Um, the U.S. government has like two thousand people that they pay basically to do nothing but throw batteries into the ocean. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. What? yeah. What? Your career, Pat. Little <laughs> math. <laughs> Little super. <laughs> Very nice. All right. This. This presentation is off the rails. Uh, for our players at home, uh, we, we finished probably covering anything to do.
thousands of them in a day, 